any form of practice, whether it's psychological or meditative or spiritual practice, there has to be some decision making about who you want to be, how you want your body to be. The moment that you're deciding, I want to learn how to manage my own reactions, whether Mm. it's with a therapist, whether it's with a meditative practice, whether it's with dynamic meditation, you have to go into this with a decision that you want that. You want to be able to calm your reactions, period. Okay. So this won't be helpful for people who don't want that. Okay. (laughs) It just won't. Right. Right. This is an existential decision. Like I want to learn how to manage how I feel. What does it take to put your life's work out there in a really big way? How much can I do with this one precious life? Welcome to The Selfish Gift. Why is it so painful to put ourselves out there in public? Where exactly are we getting triggered when that happens? And what can we do about it? Claudia Cauterucci is a multilingual, multicultural psychotherapist, international speaker, an author, and the creator of Dynamic Meditation. She has nearly 40,000 one-on-one clinical and coaching hours under her belt and a background in spiritual practices. Claudia facilitates healing from ancestral trauma and rising with greatness into the life that you choose, which she calls the heaven on earth experience. Claudia is an expert in helping people defuse the triggers that come up when we go public. And she also has personal experience of going public herself with her forthcoming book, Humanity 101. So please, um, uh, yeah, tell me about what you have learned, what you've found about like, what are, what are the things that come up for people when they, when they go to step on that grand stage of life? Yeah. And one thing to note, Maggie, is some people don't even know they want to be public. Let's say they want to be famous, but they don't even know they'll be triggered. Um, Some people will be triggered as they're making their moves, like you and me. And some people just think, oh, I want to be famous. I want to be known. And then all of a sudden, all the triggers are happening. So that's really important. Right. Bam, right. they, they're famous all of a sudden, and a list of triggers happen. You and I, at least, are moving towards that and tracking it. Um, so the very first one would be that it's ancestral for us, right? It has been in our human DNA to be afraid of going. We There's been danger in the past, real danger for I mean, being tell exposed me about that. to the be- public. Because, Mm -hmm. I mean, when we think about, I mean, going public today, I mean, back in the caveman times, there was no Twitter, there was no, you know, there there was no YouTube, there was no, those kind of big, what we think of now as the public forum. So what are the, what are the original roots of what, what did going public mean in the ancestral times? Sure. Well, we're, we're like, when we picture, for example, the Roman Colosseums where, where it was sort of a war vibe, but the whole idea was was warriors coming together and a whole public just like today going yes or no we like you we don't like you or in theater forever right if the public did not like what was happening there would be booing and throwing of things and people were taken off the stage i mean these are periods or or being a preacher um, you could really, and these are all forms of going public. And does this also um, it have its roots in like fear of ostracism, like just being cast out from the group? Absolutely. That's exactly right. So, and that's what I mean. Like it's in our DNA, right? If people went out, went, were public about being able to cure others, right? They might've been burned at the stake. Right, for, for concocting remedies. 
um, that weren't religiously based, for example, at a certain time. Sort of, yeah. the, for example, the the division between science and religion at one point. Mm. And if you were identified as someone who was publicly healing people, there was a lot of, it, it was real. It was real to be tortured. It was real to be killed. Mm. It was real to be um, killed by the mob. Exactly what you're thinking by group think. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's even worse than trolls. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Be burned at this but it's, it brings up similar survival feelings. Okay, so talk to me about those feelings. Like, how do we experience the um, that? What are those? What do those triggers show up either in our thoughts, our body, both? Um, it's a complete survival reaction. And when we say survival, it's I'm going to die. Right. So if I'm on Facebook and I'm public and everyone does not like what I said or what I'm posting, right, the feeling of having a whole group of people, even when we don't know them, not like, right, it hits on the survival program of wanting approval. And that's really, really embedded. And if we do go back to caveman era, right, if we didn't have approval, if there weren't people around us who loved us and cared about us, we'd be left behind. Mm -hmm. We'd be left behind to die. So this is in our human DNA that it activates. If we feel that we are unloved, unsafe, it feels like we're going to die. So some of the feelings are panic, sweating, heart race, right? Obsessive thinking, ruminations, um, Depression. Dry mouth. I always, I know when I'm, when I have to give a talk or so, it's always like, okay, I need a drink of water right here, right now. Dry mouth, heart palpitations, all that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very Sweaty physical. Palms. Yes. Because mm. it feels like the body starts moving into um, survival, right? How I'm about to die is what it feels like. Um, and of course, we know situations where teens become suicidal, right? This, this is serious stuff. Going public is serious stuff. And so even you um, highlighting it, Maggie, is so helpful because there's ways to track it and do this um, with preparation um, yeah. that, that might not feel traumatic when it finally does. And one of the things that um, you know we talked about earlier was also this idea about, okay, I want to go public, but uh, also, does that mean that I'm going to lose my privacy? Like that's the flip side to it, right? It's not about, it, it is about the fear of getting ostracized or judged or <laughs> burned at the stake. But it, mm-hmm. is there, tell me about the, the side of the anxiety that is about, um, losing control over our image or, or, con- or, or just losing our privacy. Oh, that's such a good question. Like losing control over our image, because I think one of the most basic human wounds and experiences is the experience of feeling misunderstood even by our parents or our friends. Especially. Yeah. Exactly. (laughs) Right. So, or our, our group. So if something is taken out of context, if someone is misquoted, this feeling of being deeply and profoundly misunderstood is also activate survival programs, right? And so, for example, this whole idea with privacy, let's say you are having a hard time with your kids. Let's say one of your children, you're famous and one of your children is drug addicted. Let's say you're in the midst of a terrible divorce, which is painful enough, right? And to all of a sudden have this be available to everyone to decide to do this, this, this idea of likes and dislikes is really powerful and goes way back Um, to feel. And I think, again, the idea that some people, a lot of us want that we want to be famous. We want to be recognized until you lose something as fragile and as valuable as privacy. Right. So why do, 
what, where does the urge, where does the urge and the yearning to put ourselves out there come from? If it's so perilous, uh, what, what are the, um, you know, the psychological roots of wanting to share mm -hmm. ourselves with the world in a big way? Mm -hmm. Well, I want to say it is perilous, but there is a way to do it. Like everything else, like every form of evolution or expansion that can actually garnish beautiful results. So I just want to say that we'll bookmark that. Yeah. Um, yeah so we'll that it doesn't that just feel sure. scary to people. No, no, no. And I, and I totally, I'm going to dig into like, okay, well, what's the answer? Like, how do we get over yes, the triggers? But, yes. but, but, um, but, but first, like, I'm just sitting with like the way that we're describing it. It just sounds like a, a like a terrible idea. <laughs> So, but I know that, I mean, there are genuine, wonderful, life-affirming reasons to put your gift out in the world. And that's what this entire podcast is about, right? So let's talk about that for a second. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So it's the same thing. It's the same survival program that gets active of wanting approval, wanting to be loved by many people, wanting to be cherished. That's one. And then we, we dip into the other survival programs, which is safety, right? So at least in our world, we know that if we're famous, we might make money. We might right. have a lot of safety in those ways. People might want us so much that they'll pay us a lot of money to have, to have our gift in the world, whether that's performing or a book or being an athlete. So feeling um, valuable, but also literally creating value, may, be, be, being valuable in a, in a, in a monetary way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and I think part of what, what, what gets overlooked is our humanity along the way. And that in our humanity, we are humans that are imperfect we are humans that have just the same needs because the part of the process of becoming public is that the person begins to rise and it seems like they're rising up above everyone else, right? So there's adoration and idolatry and you do this so well, right? But that can be a fragile place to be if, if there's no acknowledgement that we're all humans and we're all imperfect and we all have feelings and struggles and marriages and divorces and relationships. Um, that's what begins to get tricky. Um, okay. So let's go back to the, the triggers and um, what to do about them. So, you know, the folks listening to this podcast are interested in knowing how to put their gift out there in the world in a really big way. And, you know, this, conversation is highlighting a lot of emotional risks and the likely the, you know, the, the challenges and bumps that come along. So give us some tools and the antidote when we first create something or announce that we're creating something or unveil the thing that we created and all of those feelings of, you know, fear of annihilation, et cetera, that you talked about come up. How have you used dynamic meditation to help other people cope with that and not let it get in the way of them reaching their, their dreams. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the biggest tenets of dynamic meditation is that feeling all of this is normal across the board. Anytime we move into expansion of any sort. So I want to talk to you or authors here and say, of course, anytime we evolve and anytime we expand, it's going to feel a little scary because it's unfamiliar. It's going to feel a little perilous. And that can be across the board of any type of form of evolution or expansion. Okay, so this is normal. We feel these things. And if we're going to expand, it makes sense to feel them. And it makes sense to know what to do with it, right? Um, so very specific tools are having the truth inside of you as to why you want to share this. Like, what is the value you want to share about yourself or about what you're saying? 
like really anchoring in and grounding in that truth, right? Um, and knowing that there are people who will like it and people who will not. And mm. you're not for everybody. And that's absolutely okay, whether you're an athlete, a performer, an author, um, a public speaker, there's going to feel there's going to be people who resonate and people who don't resonate. But you know why you're doing it. So that's number one. Number two, any meditative or reflective practice that you have that keeps reminding you of why you're doing this, right? And we talked about mm. dynamic meditation being one. Is this where you'd like me to be more specific about dynamic? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No. Um, well, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Is this a yes. good moment to be? Yes. Yeah. So Tell us how it works. Sure. Yeah. Well, dynamic meditation in general is just a compilation of all the tools that over the years I've garnished to help me in my clinical practice, but also just personally in calming my internal sleep down. Okay, so the things that work the best and it's practical and it's portable so that you could do it anywhere at any time. And what it addresses are these survival programs that get activated. Right? So survival programs are wanting control, wanting approval, wanting safety. Mm -hmm. The other thing that activates the body is figure it out, what I call figuring it out, sort of this obsessive looping that can happen um, as a response to feeling out of control. Okay. And then the final one is wanting approval, but in a way of, of not sending your own self approval. It's not just wanting it from the people outside of you. It's actually really the internal bully, basically, your internal dialogue mm. and how you collude sometimes yeah. with your external fears. Yeah. I mean, we've heard it said so many times, people, it's kind of like a cliche. People say, oh, I'm, you know, my own worst critic. And, you know, that that's just supposed to be, um, well, that is just something that is shrugged off, but that's not an easy thing to get around. Mm. And that internal self-critic is mean and persistent and has yes. access to us at all times, right? <laughs> yes. Not yes. like you can hang up on them. They're right there when you close your eyes. <laughs> yes, Maggie. So, exactly. so, you know, the thing that I'm super curious to know about dynamic meditation um, is what is, where does the dynamic come from? Well, I think when we think about meditation, we think about stillness, right? We think about sitting and quieting the mind and trying to, <laughs> you know, sort of like, mm, just let the thoughts flow by, but, but, but it's really, it's so much about stillness. So what is, but dy dynamic means movement, I mean, you know, movement action or something, um, yeah, something, something in motion, so what's I dynamic really about dynamic? I love meditation? this question, and I'm rarely <laughs> asked it, Maggie, because well, I always explain it. I gotta know, like, I what love is, it. What, what is I it? love it. I'm because thinking it, of like it's is it do I do I meditate while I'm doing lunges? Like, what's <laughs> dynamic about it? <laughs> it's such a good question. Well, and and you know what? It's very precise. It's very specific. Okay, so number one. I'm a psychodynamic psychotherapist. I was trained psychodynamically. And what that means is psychodynamic psychotherapy is a depth psychology where we work profoundly with the unconscious, right? Um, so it, it, it branched off from psychoanalytic psychotherapy, um, but it's the same exact approach, which is to really look at the unconscious. And so I myself am psychodynamic. Got and it. the funny story about this, and you and I talked about like these, these messages, because sometimes going public is because we receive messages or we have a strong urge. I woke up in the middle of the night with the word dynamic when I was starting to do this in 2009. I launched it in 2010. So dynamic actually means 
powerful energy and force coming from within. When it's used as a noun, it's something, it's, it's this sort of lava-like force that comes from within, okay? And then, of course, the idea of becoming a dynamic person is someone who um, instigates change, who has a dynamic life, who is vibrant, who is alive. And so all of that fits, all of that fits. Um, so that's, that's the long answer as to how the name came about. But the idea of the actual toolkit, because dynamic meditation is an actual toolkit, Maggie. It's a, it's, it's a compilation of things. It's like an encyclopedia of all the stuff that I've accrued. Um, is that it's on the go. The people I work with are high achievers. They're super busy. Mm -hmm. Um, I work with a lot of people with post-traumatic stress disorder. So just the thought of sitting on a pillow to quietly meditate for 30 minutes is a struggle. Um, And I myself, I sat for years in the mornings for 30 or 40 minutes. But what I kept finding because of my own trauma, my own reactivenesses, um, that I'd receive a phone call in the middle of the day or I'd have an interaction with someone I loved and I still had really strong reactions. And so I made it a mission to find out things that we could use on the go and in the moment. Oh, I see. So when you say on the go, right. Um, so you mean like as we're moving through uh, the events and activities of our day, it's it's As not we're something on that we the bus. not something that we do for ten minutes in the morning and then go and live our lives. It's it's a thing that you incorporate as we're living those moments of our lives. Exactly, and okay. I think sitting is. I still sit in the mornings. I still uh-huh. do a lot of silent time, but I really wanted something that you could use. You know, I always say like you you see your ex somewhere. And your heart starts racing and you get all of those reactions, right? Something where you could just go into a public restroom and do it immediately. Okay. So go ahead. How does it, how does it work? Yes. So it's a series of questions that you ask yourself. It's, it's, and there's different styles, but the main one, there's different things I pull on. Sometimes I do a grounding meditation, um, but you Find a place or even let's say you're at a board meeting, Maggie, because I know you're in a lot of meetings and someone says something that you find a little triggering or you can feel yourself start to constrict. Notice my heart rate getting up a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. Or even if you're feeling it right now. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're feeling it right now. With your eyes open, uh, what I recommend is that people start doing it with their eyes closed because becoming the observer is a part of. Every meditation, every meditative practice is the ability to look at yourself inside and be aware of what's going on. Um, So becoming the observer, that's the first place. You're in the meeting or you get that phone call from your mom or you see your ex or there's a loud noise if you have post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. And you can ask and you can do it with your eyes open. You can go into a public restroom. You can be on the bus and you can ask yourself, what is this about? Is this about wanting safety, wanting control, or wanting approval? Those three are the survival programs. Now there's something. Safety, control, control, or approval. Wanting approval. Mm Mm-hmm. And those three questions were actually defined by a guy named Lester Levinson, who was a physicist in the 60s, because he identified that when we have that wanting feeling for safety, control, and approval, what happens is our body gets flooded with the energy of wanting safety, of Mm -hmm. wanting control, of wanting approval. Right. And it's an active survival program, okay? Activated one. Can I let this go? 
And even though sometimes your body or your mind's going to say, no, I don't want to let this go. Try and I say, yes, hail, try and yes, hail it out. Like, yes. Yes. But what if you really, what, I mean, what, what if you're in a situation where you don't have control uh, or someone is being directly critical and disapproving toward you? Um, and, and so this isn't just like, oh, this is me, uh, you know, having a, a, like a neurotic thought. This is a real pr- present experience of being rejected or having control taken from me, being dominated. Does, how can this support us in those moments? Like when that person mm-hmm. posts that nasty comment on your, you know, on your Twitter feed or whatever, after you put yourself mm-hmm. out there. Um, how, how does that, how do we integrate that with what our rational mind acknowledges is truly happening? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question because see, it doesn't matter if you've had post-traumatic stress or high anxiety, Mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter whether it's real or not. Wow. Your body is experiencing (laughs) it as real. Okay. Yeah. That's really important for folks to know. When we're having a panic attack or a phobia or a post-traumatic stress reaction, or we tend to be highly anxious people, the body is experiencing it as really real. It could be that someone slammed the door, that the wind slammed the door. But for someone who's been to war, that's real. That is scary. That's terrifying. So... I think that's a really good question because um, we want to validate the experience that the body is having in the moment. Yeah. So yeah, there are times. Mm -hmm. So, so if it is real and it, and it's like, yeah, that, that guy's yelling at me right now and criticizing me and calling me names or uh, accusing me of things that I know are not true. How can I use dynamic meditation to de-escalate my um, anxiety response and defuse my own triggers, even though it's not a slam door. It's, it's a jerk who's literally like shaming me in public. <laughs> how, how, how do I soothe myself through that? Sure. Well, the first thing for anybody with anxiety or having a reaction and a, and a real, in that case, like a very real reaction is to make the decision to want to calm the body. Uh-huh. Okay. And, and, okay, so let's back this up. Any form of practice, whether it's psychological or meditative or spiritual practice, there has to be some decision-making about who you want to be how you want your body to be. And this is just across the board, whether Mm. you're going public or not, right? Mm. The moment that you're deciding, I want to learn how to manage my own reactions, whether Mm. it's with a therapist, whether it's with a meditative practice, whether it's with dynamic meditation, you have to go into this with a decision That you want that. You want to be able to calm your reactions. Right. Period. Okay. So this won't be helpful for people who don't want that. Okay. (laughs) It it just won't. Right. Right. This is an existential decision. Like I want to learn how to manage how I feel. Right. I I don't want to learn. I don't want to be so vulnerable to uh, conditions or events that, that they're leading me around that I want to be able to walk through strong headwinds and stay upright. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Mm, Thank you. (laughs) Yes, yes. It's very true though. It's a decision because the world is constant. It's a stock market constantly, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're doing this all the time, so, and, and this podcast is about just suggesting to people, listen, and it doesn't have to be dynamic meditation, right? Right. It just has to be a way of approaching 
you taking your evolutionary expansive step into anything, into anything. It's beautiful, right? It's, we are suggesting you and I, Maggie, through this podcast, listen, there's ways to do this where you can calm your body, where you can infuse your spirit, where you can train your mind how to have responses that will help you. Like that's the big picture. Yeah. Yeah. To make something that feels super unsafe to make it safer because I'm going in there with, um, with some tools I can employ when I get activated because I surely can expect that I will. And number one of those is reminding yourself that it's normal to feel that way and not yes. heaping shame upon shame upon, uh, anxiety. Right. Yes. So Claudia, can you tell me mm. a little bit more about what kinds of people you have worked with and helped with this? I know that you mentioned that um, you work with high achievers and, mm -hmm. and populations with uh, or individuals with um, PTSD and high anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about the types of folks that you help with your work. And particularly, there are some that are, are really on this going public journey. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm in Washington, D.C., it is all about high achieving. People high achieved all their life to get to Washington, D.C. So pretty much across the board, this is a city that is about, you know, the career ladder and being public. Yes. This is a, a city for that. And and um, not only just public in a, yeah, I mean, not not public in a kind of a Broadway show kind of way, public with a kind of a knives out way. <laughs> Yes, in some cases, yes. Right. Like yeah. it is a national and international hub. Yeah. Right. There's a lot going on here. Exactly. So um it's a great city to live in. It's I I just absolutely <laughs> Actually, love if you're this a city. therapist. <laughs> yeah, I exactly <laughs> I love this place. No, I really do. Because it's super international as well. So that's the other people I, I work with. So I call myself a colorful person because I'm Latina. I'm half Colombian. And so I work with a lot of people of color or colorful people as I like to call myself, right? And um, and that's African-American, international, and Latinos. That's my other crew. Um, and I work with people who struggle with high anxiety for very good reasons. Mm -hmm. And I do have an expertise in post clinical post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but the way I call the people I attract, the people who resonate with me and with dynamic, um, I, Maggie, I think you and I laughed about this, but I really do. My people are fearful, fierce, and ferocious. And what I mean by that is, you know, everyone talks about being fearless, being fearless. Well, no, like we are fearful. There's fear, post-traumatic stress, there's fear. Anxiety has fear, um, but they're fierce about this process of self-exploration. There's so much just in the way that they're high achieving about their, their work life. They're high achieving about their personal life. And about their healing, you mean? Yes, yeah. Maggie. Yes, yeah. yes. And ferocious, I mean, just hungry, hungry to learn. So my folks, the folks that I attract are just all about like trying to live their best life. But it doesn't mean they're fearless. No, no, they've got some fear going. Um, so examples. Um, so I can't be specific. Right? right. But what I can say is that I have a, a large part of my roster are people who have become quite famous and are public, are out there in the world. Um, and mainly because part of our work is to get them there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I want to encourage your authors or anyone you interview, listen, everyone can stay on the sidelines. Lots of people can sit from their couches and not make these 
moves into expansion, you are out there trying to make this move. And it's scary. Right. But let's do it. Let's do it. Right. As you would say, Maggie, let's get your gift out there. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. the the folks that I've worked with, that's part of the work that's been done for them to get out there more and more and more. Okay. So some of the things that have come up is being very afraid that their past will be exposed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've all got a skeleton or two in the closet or it's sitting right on our laps or. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> yeah. We all do. That's number one. We all do. So something you did in college on a drunken night, something you said to someone when you were immature, Mm -hmm. someone you dated or multiples that you dated, Uh, maybe you had an addiction in your past. Right. So that, that fear of, wow, now that I'm public, will it be used against me? And the way we address it, Maggie, in sessions and with dynamic is, okay, let's look at that. If that's your fear, let's look at it straight on. And is this about wanting safety, wanting control, or wanting approval? Right? Right. And Back then to those we start questions. doing, is this about figuring it out? There's a whole bunch of questions. Mm. There's This isn't the only technique that Dynamic has. Mm-hmm. But basically, the idea is, is that we're afraid of our own humanity because all of us have a past. And can we move forward into the future and bring our gift and our public self into the world and not be afraid of our past? Um, Not be ashamed. That's the other thing we do. We de-shame it. Because the fear is that we'll be shamed and it will match our internal bully, as you said, our internal Mm -hmm. critic, right? And what if we de-shame it first? We do massive work, Mm -hmm. Mm. right? On quieting the bully. So we look at it straight on. This is where the ferocity comes in. This is where the fear, like, let's look at it. All right. Someone might come from the past and say, guess what? Mm -hmm. Let's work it. Okay. Yeah. Well, what you said just now really, really, really kind of, floored me when you said we're afraid of our humanity or ashamed of our humanity Mm. that yeah it's like wow I I just wonder how many people get stopped in their tracks by that fear or that shame without even realizing it Um, and I think that Mm. the belief or the thought behind that emotion is I'm not supposed to get up there and stand on that stage or put out that book or do that thing out loud or ask for that attention until I am free of blemishes. And I know my own flaws, my weaknesses, my stupid mistakes, um, even, even knowing my own, uh, you know, we can be ashamed of shame, right? It's like, I, I have shame inside and they're going to be able to smell it on me. I shouldn't put myself out there because like, they'll be able to tell. And so I can't start until I am free of that. I can't start until I have no fear, until I have no wounds, until I have no errors. Until And that's not human. Exactly. <laughs> I love this. Actually, I really want us to like pause on this moment. Right. Right. Yeah. It is our humanity to be imperfect. Yeah. So when we're high achieving, when we're um, overachievers, we fear our imperfection. And yet that's who we are. We're constantly imperfect. We're constantly making mistakes. That's how we learn. The whole life journey is experience after experience after. Sure, sure, there's addictions. Sure, there's abuse. Sure, there's post-traumatic stress. Yes, that is humanity since day one of humanity. Right. So when the critic stands up and throws that shit at you and it's like, look at this, look at this nasty shit. This is yours. You can stand there strong and go, yep, that's my shit. Exactly. I'm standing up here anyway. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) 
Exactly. Right. I'm talking about parenting because this is the way I messed it up. Right. I'm talking about this. I'm sharing my wound I, uh, about heartbreak because I've been married three times. Yeah. Like I have stuff to give you. Yeah. Because of my wound. I'm in my, my first chapter in my book is called the, the, the wound is the gift. The wound is the gift. If we work it. Oh, this makes me so passionate and alive because Yes, we're human, we're blemished and beautiful. Blemished and beautiful. Um, and that is humanity. Um, so yeah, this 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 that's the other thing, right? This idea that we cannot be public until we're perfect. Oh no, no, no. Yeah. The risk, the risk of being public is so amazing. It's <laughs> so amazing. Okay. So you just said that, uh, you just mentioned your book and that reminds me mm -hmm. that you are walking the talk on this business because this Woo! is you going public in a new way. And I know that, you know, you've been going public for a while in various forms and with your workshops and your groups, et cetera, et cetera. But now you're writing a book yourself. And mm -hmm. so, yes. um, I suppose you don't have this problem, right? I suppose it's, nothing's <laughs> coming up. You're not getting triggered. Um, you're absolutely <laughs> triggered. Listen. Okay. So my shares on it's, and this is for everyone, but the reason why, because I'm doing my own, you know, imposter syndrome in my case, and this is the point of my whole book is about this, right? So in the psychotherapy world, it can be very research-based and academically based and high intellectualism, which personally I love. Mm -hmm. I love to nerd out on all of that. I'm like, I love being an academic and an intellectual, but I feel that in order for there to be parity, clarity, and availability to all of us, all of us humans, right? Um, we have to talk about it in ways that come from the heart and that come from our own experience. Um, so imposter syndrome is something I work with a lot. Uh -huh. And imposter syndrome, all imposter syndrome is, is all the ways we didn't feel parented. Mm -hmm. All the ways we walk around in the world feeling like we don't know something. Right. And so the way I've handled that in my own book is like, listen, there's a ton of things I don't know. No shame there. I'm just going to share what I do know. Right. right? I'll right. share what I do know. Um. And do you use the, your techniques? Are you, are you finding yourself like asking you ask, when you sit down to write, are you, uh, you know, do you find yourself getting like, uh, nervous or antsy or whatever, however it manifests in you? And then, and then, and then do you apply these questions? How does that, how does that look? How does that feel? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the things that comes up for me is the whole fear of like, what if it's not liked? Mm -hmm. right? What sure. if it's not liked? What if, what if I get the thumbs down? Okay. Right. So can I let go of wanting approval? Let me, let, let's really talk about why, because everyone who's going to write a book or everyone who's going to go public will feel this. What if they hate my movie? Right. Right. What right. if I don't look right? Yeah. What if I mess up? Okay. What if nobody buys the truth? What I'm Remember we talked yeah. about grounding yourself in truth. That's always going to be true that people want there. There's a whole group of people who won't like it. There's right. a whole group of people that might hate it. Right. And there's a whole group of people that will respond to it. Okay. Right. The task is doing it. So when we're really parenting a child, it's not saying stop. Don't go out into the world. It's saying, babe, go out, try it. But I might fall. Sure. Right. You might. you might. Which leads to the other tool, right, Maggie? Which is have people who care about you and champion you mm -hmm. and believe in you. And that's in psychology, we would call it that, where you feel securely attached. People mm -hmm. who say, do it anyway. You might fall. Sure. You might mess up. Sure. 
Right. There might be people who don't like it. Sure. Right. So anchoring or not just might will there will Will. they're they're just will so let's not yeah even take the risk factor out it is a certainty it's not a risk Mm -hmm. it's a certainty there will be people who don't like it right expansion is all about that the risk of moving forward um you asked about some of my clients who become very public you know some of my clients come from pasts um where they were pretty low income at one point Uh uh-huh and so some of the fears is what I call leaving the neighborhood. Yeah. Sort of moving out and, and people become famous. You see this in rappers, you see this where they've left their neighborhood. So some of the fears are, am I abandoning my family? Am right. I am I a bad person for wanting this? Am I yes. being disloyal to my roots? Yes. Am I Will disrespecting? I be seen as having yeah. heirs? Right. right. Will I? Yeah. And so that always puts obstacles to expansion and evolution, right? Immediately. It's like, I'm too afraid to do that. So I'm just going to stay where I've always been. Mm-hmm. This is for everyone. Mm-hmm. This isn't just for people who want to become public. It's for anyone who wants to sort of work on the highest version of themselves. Well, let's pivot to that now because this seems like mm-hmm. this seems like a good time to to move into that side of the conversation, which is, you know, this this podcast is called the selfish gift because it's not just a gift you give to others; it's a gift that you, the giver, benefit from, right? Like we we share that thing that we are or that we have for reasons, some of which are altruistic, definitely, and about you know service, yes, and. Some of those reasons for sharing our gift are about fulfilling our own potential and feeling the joyful expansion of that, or about wanting to bring abundance into our lives, or about just the the sheer pleasure of creating and seeing what we're capable of. So let's let's talk about that for a minute. I would love to know, first of all, your yeah, your thoughts on how we can support ourselves to proactively move into that space. And then I also want to know what are your reasons for, for not just writing the book, but for doing this work with others. For sure. Yeah. So, I, and I, I absolutely love the name of your podcast. I love it because they're so, it's, I, it's true. It's so nuanced. It has so much in there, especially selfish with the capital S, right? Because that's like about the self. Um. So my take and dynamic, so my whole, I call it a movement dynamic re-evolution is mm-hmm. all about the life journey, the arc of the life journey. And in the arc of the life journey, we are actually moving towards our highest, and I like to say our favorite version of ourselves, which sometimes can be different. <laughs> Right. I Sometimes love that. Being, Our favorite being my version. favorite version, right, is like oh, cute no, no. and funny. Right. I, hang on a sec. Let's just back up a bit because I did not mean to get a calendar notification just then. So you like to call it our favorite version of ourselves. I I love yes, that because they, you know, we think we hear a lot about um oh, living my best life or my best version of myself. But who's to I mean, I love favorite because it takes the kind of good, bad qualifier out, right? It's just like, this is the version of me that I most strongly prefer. <laughs> I can love you call this, it best right? or less and, than best. Yes, favorite <laughs> is really, yeah. you know, because you can be cute and you can be funny and maybe you're cuddly, maybe your favorite self is, and highest is cool too, right? Yeah. Highest is cool too. But as we're moving towards that, um, we are moving. so. I hold a belief that whatever it is that we're doing inside of ourselves has an impact externally. So if I'm healing, if I am trying to shed and understand my trauma, if I'm transmuting it and alchemizing it in order for the, for the wound to be the gift. Okay. Not only will the people that I attract, be there, I, it will resonate, um, I will be able to share my process. There will be people out on the planet, right, around me, 
who will match this process. Mm -hmm. Now, I feel that all along the way. If all the way back in the journey, I'm also addicted, Mm -hmm. I will attract that, right? Mm -hmm. Or let's say if I came from an abusive background, I might attract abusive people. See, because we match, our internal existence matches our external existence. So, So Maggie, on the life journey, right? As you're moving and you're healing, let's say someone like you. Um, Example. Right. Or me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's how this book is coming about. Using all the stuff that I learned through my own trauma, my own phobia, mm-hmm. my no, own anxiety, my own reactive relationships. I'm using all of that, all of my wounds as gifts, right? To find to attract the people where this might fit. Mm -hmm. So me embodying and possibly becoming um, someone who's done the journey, who's understood her journey, um, that might have an impact with others who are doing the same work. Right. Um, So as we move into the big S, yeah, the the big S, (laughs) not the little S, like really the big S is important as I become more of me, more of me, more self love. Yeah. All of that. I'm going to be able to share some juicy, good stuff with the world. Yeah, that's something. Your whole podcast is that. That's your whole podcast. You know, the way you're describing it, I almost feel like the word selfish should be hyphenated because like we think of selfish Mm. as like being, well, that's a pejorative, that's a put down. And sure, selfish is not a good thing if if what you mean by that is to be inconsiderate of others. But that's that's not what this is about. This is it this is not it's not selfish, it's self ish. So my gift is about myself. My gift is self related it's self ish you know yes it's like capital s e l f then i s h in 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 small letters right it is about yeah, the self yeah. the capital s right and the more you move into that maggie look you're a great example right you moving into your big self with this podcast and taking the risk Look at what you're going to be able to do by, by, by gifting others with, with others, other people's work. Yeah. So there is like, um, I have a mentor who talks about the win, 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 the win for me, the win for others and the win for the planet. Right. There's a win, win, win that begins to happen when we actually move into our highest self. Right. Oh, it's just so beautiful, the oh. concept, right? The well, more I work on myself, the better mom I am. Right. right? That's the thing. That's like, and this is what, um, this is what's so ironic about it because, um, like getting back to the notion of selfishness again, and I feel like we could have a whole discussion just on that topic, but <laughs> I think that that is also one of the stumbling blocks that prevents us from bringing our fullness out into the world is this idea that like, oh, if I... If I'm going to focus on my art really intensively until I finish this film or this album or this novel or whatever, like that's kind of a selfish thing. I have to block other people out and putting myself, you know, or if I desire to live a really abundant life and I'm trying to consciously and deliberately, you know, cultivate and grow a connection with an audience. And, you know, if I, if I want to grow my Instagram following, like those things don't happen by accident. I mean, maybe they sometimes do, but a lot of, we're, we're talking about the act of putting conscious attention toward that goal. And one of the fears that can get in the way is this idea that like, oh, that seems really selfish. Um, Whereas actually what you're saying is by expanding ourselves consciously and deliberately into this favorite version, um, that's actually our greatest gift to the world around us. It's really true. If you think of it, I, I, I love I love your questions. If you think of it, you know, the whole purpose of therapy 
or of meditative practices. I love them both. Or, yeah. Right. Of mm -hmm. healing our trauma and our anxiety is to reach the state of just loving oneself. And that goes back to humanity 101, right? Loving humanity 101. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. The that's name, the name yeah, of my book. Yeah, yeah. Humanity right, right. 101, which is the idea that I'm going to love the journey I've been on, my life right. journey, right? The Buddha talked about that. I mean, this is like, so, so it's tricky, okay? It's tricky because as we're doing this, there are wobble moments. I call them wobble moments where some people in our past will be like, well, I don't like this new you mm -hmm. who wants to be the favorite version of yourself. That's <laughs> right. going to happen. Right. Okay. Right. And there's going to be maybe an audience like what we just talked about that doesn't like it. So, but those are just wobble moments. Where well, we and I guess there champions. can be an internal wobble moment too, right? Mm -hmm. Where you set out on this journey for all these exciting reasons. And then as you're sort of starting to get a little successful, you know, the ego might run away from us. And we, and again, forgetting our humanity and feeling like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm more important than people who don't have the same number of followers <laughs> that I do, whatever. Right. And that's where... That's where uh, we get to, you know, experience situations that will keep us in check and knock us down. Sure. And that, you know, That's what I dancing. call like hi hierarchical competition. Right. And hierarchical competition is really tricky and fragile because we're always playing the game of I'm better or I'm worse. Right. And, and they're both kind of painful places to be in their own way, aren't they? Right. If yeah. you're on top, you have the fear of falling. If you're on, if you're down below, then you just feel, you know, crushed and, and diminished. Yeah. And so how to step out of that all together and just enjoy being on the path. Well, that's why the favorite version is like my favorite version is that I'm less and less afraid of becoming uh. public. My favorite version is that I do wobble right. and then I use all of my tools when I'm wobbly. Um, my favorite version is that I get afraid a lot and I ask for help. So we oh, cannot do this wow. alone. We cannot mm -hmm. do this without tools. We cannot do this without being human or having a past or being blemished or being imperfect. Yeah, that's the life journey. I love it. And so having these tools and these self-truths and people like you, helping us do this um, for real, right? Really. That's why we need people like you. It's and people like you. Cloudy. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really, it's really, really, it's really beautiful, isn't it? It's really exciting. It's so much, it's so easy to appreciate the generosity of others when they bring their gift forward and, um, mm -hmm. And, and it's important to remind ourselves that that's, you know, that's what we're giving ourselves permission to do as well. Um, and that there will be those out there who love us, appreciate us <laughs> and, uh, and want what we're selling. <laughs> well, I, I think I really love the way that I like, this is a tool, everyone, this is a tool. I like sort of calling it preferences. There's mm -hmm. going to be people who prefer me. Right. Like they okay. prefer the color blue or they prefer to not eat meat. Right. And there's going to be people who don't prefer me. Right. And they have that choice. Right. They right. cannot prefer me because I am not resonating. I'm not a match to where they are on the journey. And that's totally fine. Right. I will be a match to someone on some journey in their life. Um, yeah. Like the way all my teachers, dynamic meditation is all about the teachers along the way that I read, that I went to see, that really impacted me, um, yeah. right? Like Lester Levinson, like the one I told you about the survival programs, like that matched me at that time. Um, references, it's a really... Oh, Claudia, yeah, that, an, Claudia, that is just so... <laughs> Beautiful. I love it. There are so many um, fantastic gems in that conversation that I'm just going to mm. 
look back on for a long time and really draw upon. Um, so uh, I know that the book is still in the works. And yeah. in the meantime, where can people find out more about you, whether on social media or your website? Tell us where, where we can find you. Well, I am completely in the midst of a sort of rebranding, but, and all of that will be under my name, ClaudiaCutterucci.com. And Cutterucci is one R and two C's. Um, And that's Instagram and Facebook and my website and my YouTube channel. All of it is ClaudiaCutterucci.com. And my YouTube channel, I started my YouTube channel for my clients. Mm -hmm. So that they would have me leading them through um, the tools oh, at four great. in the morning. Oh my you know, gosh. We wake up at four anxious. <laughs> so we need a voice that we know. Um, so that's how my YouTube channel started was just for my clients. And are those, and uh, are, those um, are those videos also available to like anyone who wants to go in there or yeah. Yes, okay, now great. they are. Oh. If you're listening to this and you want to experience Claudia um, uh, speaking to you soothingly in your ear at four o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the afternoon, or any old time of the day or night, find her on YouTube at Claudia Catarucci with two C's and one R. Claudia, (laughs) thank you so much for being my guest today and for bringing all of your wisdom and your big, beautiful, colorful heart. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> yes, I want to tell people who are listening, do it, even if it's wobbly, mm. do it, move into your own evolution and your own expansion. Thank you, Maggie. Wonderful. So much. Thank you so much. I really hope this conversation has inspired you to give so much of your gift to the world that it expands you into your greatest possible version of yourself. Remember, it's not selfish just because we also benefit from it. And here's where I get to make a selfish request. New podcasts need all the help they can get. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate the show and subscribe to us on your favorite platform. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Selfish Gift Podcast. And send me a DM. I'd love to hear how you're sharing your gift with the world.